Okay, well, uh, let's get started here, Rich. Um, if you want to give us a little, uh, obviously, this is a, a race that the whole community is pretty interested in and uh, has has read a lot about the goings on of the um, of the county attorney's office. So, so give me your take on, I mean, if I'm a, a voter coming up saying you're in the middle of, of, of a lot of this drama, how, how could you come in and, and serve effectively in the county attorney's office and, and what would that look like? Yeah. Um, you know, at serving effectively in the county attorney's office is, essentially means being an effective chief prosecutor, you know, for the most part. And that's both being a prosecutor and being in charge of an office. Um, I get along with everybody in that office. I've, I've known everyone in that office for some time now uh, outside of the incumbent. And uh, I, I have no doubt that we'll be able to work together. There's a lot of good people in that office who are, who haven't been in a good situation to let their talents grow or to sort of demonstrate their worth in the best way possible. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to do that, to promote uh, the other people in that office and to sort of get everyone's strengths um, out there. I think a lot of people have read things about the county attorney's office and the goings on at the county attorney's office, but they haven't read all that much about what the county attorney's office actually does and and what the county attorney's office should be doing. You know, when I talk to people uh, just knocking on doors, they they care about plea agreements. They, they don't understand a lot of the plea agreements that they see coming out of the county attorney's office. And they care about what I guess you'd call the drama uh, and just sort of being embarrassed by how the county attorney has conducted himself. And I think most people see that it hasn't been, it, it's not drama in the soap opera sense of like, there are all these different plot lines and things like that. It's, it's one person who was elected county attorney. He was unqualified. Um, for that office, I think by temperament mainly, and uh, we've sort of reaped the reward of that. There, you know, there is sort of an alternate universe out there where there's not a lot of drama in the county attorney's office. I didn't stick around. Um, you know, like the other prosecutors, the experienced prosecutors who left the office, uh, if I had just left, there probably would have been a lot less drama in that office, at least a lot less public drama. But you know, I grew up in Dubuque. Being a prosecutor is a job that I love, and being a prosecutor in Dubuque is a perfect fit for me. It's something that I wouldn't give up for the world. So I wasn't about to leave just because the leadership in the uh, corner office was was bad. And and to me, it's a it's really a duty for public servants to point out when there's a problem uh, in an elected position like that. And I think if 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 Things had gone differently if I had just left the office and said, you know what, I'm going to go be a prosecutor someplace else. Then I think Dubuque County would be in a worse position, frankly, and um, probably uh, looking at a different set of candidates, you know, for for November. So I don't I don't think of the drama necessarily as a bad thing. I think it was a necessary thing to uh, get the change in that office, and I think Dubuque County voters essentially saw that too. They they spoke very clearly in June when when Mr. May lost his primary, um, and you know I think most people are ready for a change in leadership down there, where it's not just electing a party official or or somebody who's been associated with a party for a long time. We we really ought to elect someone who wants to do the job they're being elected for and has some qualification to do that job. So I think just having my background, having been a prosecutor for a number of years, both in the Army JAG Corps and in the county attorney's office, uh, I think that lends itself a lot more to leading that office, that and knowing all the people there. Just give us a, a quick bit of background there on how many years in the JAG Corps, how many years in the county prosecutor's office? Yeah, so I graduated law school in 2008, and then I, I went into the JAG Corps directly after that. So basically studied and passed the Iowa bar and then joined the JAG Corps. I had always planned to come back to Iowa. I just didn't know if it was going to be, you know, working for a law firm, something like that. I felt called to to join the army, sort of a lingering sense of duty after 9-11 and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I felt I should have been doing something. So uh, that felt like something that I could contribute to 
Uh, when I started in the JAG Corps, we very quickly got into criminal law. Most Army JAG attorneys are doing some sort of criminal law at some point, and um, that's where I found that I, I found my calling, I would say. I found it very meaningful, and it was something that I was good at and was also contributing to the overall mission of the JAG Corps. I, I was in the JAG Corps for six years. I had a few years at Fort Bliss, Texas, a year deployment in Afghanistan, and a couple years stationed in Germany. And the great thing about the Army JAG Corps is you get a lot of leadership styles, a lot of leadership examples, and immediately you are expected to be a leader. You know, you come in as a commissioned officer, you're leading enlisted soldiers, you're leading other officers who are coming in after you, you're training your replacement all the time. So uh, it's a great experience, not only for the practical courtroom part of it, but also the leadership, mentorship, just constantly training part of it too. And when I, when I went to Afghanistan for that year, I found that to be an extremely valuable experience because I was working with Afghan prosecutors too. So I, you know, I worked with American soldiers, I worked with NATO soldiers, but my main mission was working with Afghan prosecutors in the province where I was, trying to get public jury trials going and trying to assist them in, in prosecuting terrorism suspects over there, turning over forensic evidence, helping them present that stuff in court, turning over weapons and things like that. So uh, coordinating all of that was a fantastic experience and it was, I was lucky to get it. I, you know, it was one where I got to leave base a lot of the time when a lot, a lot of lawyers were kind of stuck doing paperwork on base most of the time if they deployed. Um, after I left Afghanistan, I went to Germany for a couple of years, and then I left the army and came back to Dubuque. I wanted to come back home. You know, my parents are still here. A lot of my siblings are still around too. And uh, I started working at a private firm here, uh, First E. Carew. Uh, I worked there for a couple of years, and then I joined a firm with my wife, I met my wife here in Dubuque, and then we, I went to practice with her. Uh, she was a practicing attorney at the time as well. So I was in private practice for about four years, three and a half years, and then I joined the county attorney's office in March of 2018. I was hired to be the domestic prosecutor, so I immediately took on prosecution of all domestic cases. And uh, about six months in, Rye Meyer left the office after losing the primary to, to Mr. May. And uh, after he left, I took over a prosecution of all the sexual abuse cases too. Um, so that, that led to a lot of work um, and it's work I was happy to do. I, you know, over my four years in the county attorney's office, I think the number is 37 cases that I took to a jury trial. Um, I don't think anyone in the office was anywhere near double digits even. And part of that was the subject matter of my cases, you know, domestics and sexual abuse cases are oftentimes more uh, contested, but it was also just the philosophy I brought with me, I think from the, from the JAG Corps, which was, we're not gonna wait around and wait for cases to, to linger a while. We're not gonna take a lot of time. There's a process that we have that can work actually fairly quickly. Everyone can get a speedy trial. Um, plea bargaining doesn't have to be a long and drawn out process. Um, so a lot of times I found myself just going to trial on cases if we if we didn't have a good plea bargain. Um, right now, I think there's such a backlog at the county attorney's office that it's, it's hard to imagine people are getting to trial um, at all quickly after their case is filed unless they insist on a trial within 90 days. Otherwise, I think things just get pushed out for months and months after that. My philosophy would be that we, we can get most cases resolved within 90 days. There are some that take longer, but um, that should be our standard. So you obviously seem to have the most uh, prosecu prosecutorial um, experience of, of anybody running. So how how much does that matter? I mean, is it, uh, is it, um, challenging for somebody who hasn't worked in the county attorney's office to to step in into a leadership role yeah i mean i i, I think if if the last four years taught us anything it's probably that to some extent um i i got the opportunity again in the jack court to be both a defense attorney and a prosecutor and it was very important in those roles that you had a strong 
period, a, a strong period of training of sort of indoctrination in what you're doing. Because when you're a defense attorney, you are trying to protect your clients at all costs. You're trying to get the best result at trial. Um, whatever the truth is, it's not really that, it, that's not what you're after when you're a defense attorney. It's it's trying to get the best result for your client and 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 doing that duty for your client. And that's a good and honorable thing for defense attorneys to do. Um, being a prosecutor is different because you're not serving a client in the same way. You know, you, your client is the state of Iowa, but really your duty is to find the truth. The state of Iowa is not interested in wrongful convictions any more than it's interested in letting guilty people go. What we need is the truth. We, we try to get that through the adversarial process, but prosecutors have to be sort of laser focused on it. And I think it does take work. It takes practice. You know, it's something I've practiced for a number of years, and I still find that there are times where it's easier to sort of fall back and say, well, you know, let's just get this case resolved or, or uh, you know, a plea bargain here makes sense because, you know, we don't want to spend time on it. But sometimes you have to you have to remind yourself almost every day as a prosecutor, what we're after is the truth. If what I'm doing is not leading to the truth and it's not leading to justice for the defendant, for victims, for the community, uh, then then I need to relook at what I'm doing. I need to make sure I'm dedicating myself that day to pursuing the truth. Um, so it, you know, it's not an impossible thing. Obviously, people can make the switch, but I think if you're talking about coming in and leading an office of other prosecutors, um, especially ones who maybe haven't been there that long, you know, our office right now is not full of senior attorneys or people who have been doing that job for a long time. I think it's very important in that in that case to have someone who can keep people on track, keep reminding people what it means to be a prosecutor, and uh, to help provide good examples of that. Well, you talked about temperament in in reference to CJMA, and I guess I need to ask you about that as well. You know, in in a lot of our the the work that we did and and the research into um, what was going on in the county attorney's office, you know, we had uh, we had some emails that we saw. We saw a lot of emails that were between uh, you and the county attorney, and um, you know, to be honest, uh, it, 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 they were pretty harsh um, coming from you. Um, you, you know, for somebody who hadn't been in the office all that long when, when CJ, when CJ was elected, um, it, early on, you seem to kind of dictate of how, here's how we do things around here. Um, uh, there were emails that I saw that I thought, you know, I I don't think I've ever gotten an email like that from somebody who answered to me. And I can tell you, we'd have been having a conversation. So do you take some responsibility there? Do you feel like that is an indication of your management style or or tell us tell us about that? Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any emails from me in the first couple of years that I would characterize as very strongly worded or anything like that. I, I think probably Gosh, and, and maybe I'm I'm not remembering something, but when CJ came on board, you know, I knocked on doors for him. I was very much supportive of him back in 2018 because he seemed like a nice guy, and that's that's sort of what I observed. But um, I remember giving him some very friendly advice. I, I I certainly never told him this is how we do things around here or anything like that. I think. The first time that that sort of thing comes around is um, after a couple of years, I believe there was an email that I sent while I was out sick with COVID that, um, you know, during that time, he was still asking me questions about simple, nonsensical issues that weren't really issues. And I, I, I do believe there was a, a short tempered email there. But uh, one thing that I have always practiced and one thing that was always drilled into me in the army was you should be honest with your superiors you should be telling them if, if something doesn't look right and i remember the first time that i i did that with cj it was probably after he'd been there for over a year and uh, at, at some point we met in his office and and we we talked it through i thought we had a decent conversation about like communication and how uh, maybe our styles were different there i i I thought, you know, quick and, and honest communication was the best way to go. He didn't always appreciate that. He wanted things to be a little more more roundabout or something like that. But um, we had what I thought was a professional conversation. But what I took 
after that was he never forgave me for the way that that he he perceived that I was calling his judgment into question. And then, you know, things obviously continued to get worse after that. And I did have serious questions about his judgment. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for a prosecutor or any attorney to just keep their mouth shut and let things continue going when you're seeing actual miscarriages of justice. Um, because those emails between me and him, some of it was about the office functioning, uh, the obvious lack of professional boundaries that he was showing with uh, one particular employee. Um, but it was also about things that were happening in cases. You know, the, these were actual criminal cases going to trial sometimes, and he was uh, mishandling things. And, uh, you know, that's not something that any prosecutor should stay quiet about. Um, as far as my management style, I'd like I said, I had a lot of good examples of leadership in the army as well as practice doing it. Um, one of those things is praising in public and 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 uh, reprimanding in private, um, which again was very different from from Mr. May's style, where it could be screaming at someone very publicly if if uh, he didn't like what was going on. Um, and you know, I take issue with people who do that. I I, I do take issue with toxic leadership. And I'm not going to. I guess apologize for any of that. Um, oh, beyond that, I, you know, I don't want to sound defensive about it. It's just I think I can fall back on the way I've actually been able to work with people on cases to say, uh, yeah, I mean, I I get along with a lot of people even under high stress situations, both in the army and and on cases here in Dubuque. Um, you know, talking with victim advocates on child sex abuse cases or talking with victims of domestic abuse cases. There are often people who are very stressed out about things, about uh, what's going on with their case. Um, there's a lot of, you know, pressure to try and get the right result in those cases. And uh, I think if you look at my record, I handled myself well in those cases. Sometimes I do take a toll and sometimes I take it to heart, but uh, I don't think there was ever a case where I would cross a professional boundary or um, do anything except the utmost in pursuit of justice in those cases. And uh, I think I think just about everybody would agree with that. I don't I don't know of any other examples. But you know, to your original point, I do agree. I had some very strongly worded emails with CJ, but that was after a time where sort of informal communication had broken down and um, I felt that there were things that needed to be addressed in a strong way. And do you feel like, I don't know to what degree you can talk about what the allegations that that Allie Newsom uh, posed uh, as well um, and your your behavior towards her? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to talk about that. I, my behavior with Allie was nothing but professional in my my years at the office and her, and her years at the office. Even the last meeting I had with her, which has been the subject of so much so much ink at this point, um, was a very, what I thought, professional meeting. Didn't involve any raised voices, didn't involve insults. It involved some some honest criticism, for sure. But, um, you know, we also talked in that meeting about work we were doing. We talked about, uh, you know, her dad's surgery. We were, we were talking about personal things, and we still had a good personal relationship at this point. And it wasn't until I sent the email to CJ later in the week um, about his lack of professional boundaries. It wasn't until then that all of a sudden this meeting became something else. Um, and that to me is just an unfortunate um, conspiracy, I guess, of, of those two people. Um, you know, I, and I think that's probably what came out in the investigation. I still haven't obviously seen the investigative report uh, or seen exactly what other witnesses would have said, but um, that's all I can sort of guess from that. And, you know, the other part of this is by that point in March of 2022, CJ had been very harassing towards a number of employees in that office. A number of people had already left. Obviously, there was the article that the TH published um, with some of those employees in there. And I had also filed my own harassment complaint against CJ. This was back in May of 2021. Um, you know, I had... Uh, and I went through the whole grievance process with the county who eventually said, no, we're not going to investigate it. We're not going to do anything about it, you know, regarding my harassment complaint. So a lot of those emails that I sent to CJ, which might have been more strongly worded, uh, that was after the county had already said, you're on your own. And uh, so 
rather, again, rather than walking away, I was going to defend myself and defend that office. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think there's, I'm, I'm happy to answer whatever other questions you have, I guess, about uh, Ms. Newsom's complaint. But I, I was just very saddened by it because I had never been anything but nice to her in the office and the same way with the other support staff in that office. I don't think anyone would say I'd ever been, been mean or, or demanding or overbearing in any way. And uh, my complaints were to CJ about her work performance in general. But when that went nowhere and when he would just use that to uh, sort of drive a wedge between people, I, I didn't have much recourse except to talk with her directly and say, hey, can we, can we fix this? And I thought we did, frankly. Mm -hmm. And and now the county's received a letter uh, expressing that sounds like that there could be a, a lawsuit filed uh, that she might file a lawsuit. So if if that were you know if you were elected, I'm guessing that would come to pass. So what what would that look like uh, for the county for you? I mean, what is what is a voter to think and say? Gee, I'd rather avoid that kind of mess. Well, I don't, I don't know that it makes a difference whether or not I'm elected. I guess, regardless of what happens, there the county has to deal with what the county has done, um, and that's going to happen regardless of who gets elected county attorney. Um, I, I, you know, I think they already have outside counsel hired. They have an insurance company who's covering the county, who takes care of that sort of stuff. So, you know, frankly, I don't know that it it'll make any difference who the county attorney is. I, someone will have to deal with that lawsuit. I mean, obviously from my perspective, that's a frivolous lawsuit if it does get filed and, and there's no actual harassment or claim uh, or liability for the county, but it's obviously something that still has to be defended. I wouldn't have any part in defending it if I'm county attorney, so I don't think it would have any effect on, on my work or really the work of the county attorney's office at that point. I mean, in some ways it would be easier because I wouldn't, I wouldn't be part of it, so. Uh, it's not something I would have to spend a whole lot of time working on. Um, that's really something for outside counsel to handle anyway. Well, I have other questions on other topics uh, related to the county attorney's office, but I want to wrap this up here. So if, yeah. if Dustin, I know, I mean, he's been the editor on a lot of this stuff and followed this closely. Is there some questions that you might have? Well, I just, I mean, I think we've covered it and I think Amy's right. I don't don't want to be labored to just this point because there's obviously a lot of other things I want to talk to you about, Rich. Um, but so refresh my memory. I think in our reporting, the email regarding uh, Allie Newsom, the pretty critical email that was sent to CJ May was also sent to other members in the county attorney's office. Yeah, it was sent to the members of my bargaining unit. I, I, I figured CJ was going to do some sort of disciplinary action after I sent that email, um, so I wanted them to be aware because all of them would have to sign off if there was going to be a grievance or anything like that. Okay, so how does that? How does that kind of? I mean, to me, that that kind of flies in the face of of what you just said with this mantra of you know praising in public, reprimanding in, in private. That seemed like a very a uh, public and intentional kind of attack on, on her. Um, and on well, it wasn't really an attack on her. It was an attack on CJ. It well, I mean, quoting from it, uh, she has no natural aptitude, I believe was one of the quotes. I mean, I, to, to, to assess it as anything but a, a critical of her, I think it's unfair. Sure. Um, yeah, it was, it, no, it, it obviously was critical of her, um, but the sort of, inspiration for the email the whole reason i sent it was because of the way he was treating her and insulating her from any sort of uh criticism at all okay and it, it wasn't a secret either i mean th this is something that the other attorneys in the office were already very familiar with um sure. every, I, I obviously had a lot of direct experience dealing with her because she was supposed to be the victim advocate on sexual abuse cases so i had a lot of problems in, in, on those cases that I had to fix myself, but the other attorneys in the office were very aware of it. The other secretaries in the office were aware of it. You know, there's long lists of cases where she didn't do the work she was supposed to do. So yeah, it, it, it definitely was critical. Um, it wasn't anything new that anyone else didn't know. And the point was, even though we've all identified these problems, 
there's been no effort by leadership to take care of it. One one follow up question. I think yeah. we can probably move on. Um, so, I mean, there has been a, a fair amount of turnover in, in the county attorney's office, and I think we want to talk about that a little bit more. And you know, once we move on here, but a certain number of of the folks who are there while all this is transpiring are still there um and have kind of seen the way this played out uh the way particularly with like an email like that you kind of um publicly call out a colleague um what do you what do you think how do you establish i mean is there any concerns about establishing good relationships with those folks if you now are elected as their boss yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a concern in the sense that I want to have a good relationship with everyone in that office. I don't think I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the way we get there. I don't think it takes all that long, but you know, the, for me, it's very easy to bury the hatchet with people, and and um, I, I'm not one to hold grudges. Um, and I don't think I don't think the rest of the office is like that either. Um, and, and frankly, I have a good relationship with everyone else in that office still. Um, I, I've never, to my knowledge, ever had someone say, oh, I didn't like the way Richard talked to me or or anything like that. Um, and I think everybody knows sort of the unique circumstances that led to that email about Nelly. I, I, I can't foresee a situation where that would repeat itself. All right. Uh, Amy, you got something? Otherwise, I'll keep going. Well, no, right. I just, I mean, shifting the kind of the, the, the makeup of the county attorney's office and the departures and I'm just kind of curious, you know, you're, you're elected, you know, what, what steps need to be taken? I mean, can you give us kind of an assessment of the staff we do have and, and what needs to, to happen to, you know, improve or, or make changes to that office? Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of the staff who are there are very good, very competent. People, um, I think one thing that has to change probably sooner than later is just the hierarchy in the office. I think for the past few years, it's been 20 people whose only supervisor is the county attorney. I don't think that's right. I don't think that leads to good uh, management in that office. So there needs to be uh, you know, someone who is sort of over the support staff and office manager, uh, and there needs to be a first assistant county attorney who, you know, the county attorney can delegate some things to um, and who can represent the county when the county attorney is not available um, on some of the more important issues. So I think that would be something I would look to to sort of fill right away. And then uh, with the attorneys, there's a lot of things that could be modified when it comes to people's strengths in that office and doing a more appropriate sort of distribution of the cases that come in. Um, Again, for the last few years, it's been very ad hoc about who is doing what cases. You know, when I took on sex abuse cases, that was before CJ got there. And the idea was this is going to be temporary. You know, after he gets here, we're going to redo all the case assignments and get everybody to sort of a better position. And I would remind him of that every now and then, like, hey, this is this is a lot of stuff. You know, we can kind of maybe move these things around or, or do something else with, with case distribution. And the only times it would change was when somebody left the office and then it's like, well, we need to hand out all these cases now to somebody else. And it, there was never a system to say, look, let's have some felony prosecutors and some misdemeanor prosecutors. Let's have an intake attorney who can look at cases right when they're coming in and do some of that work right away that might make things easier down the road. You know, we can have more of like a trial team in that office, uh, people who are very focused on those cases that we know are going to go to trial and not necessarily on the the run of the mill or typical cases that often end up in a plea agreement um and i think doing that sort of change in the case distribution will have a very good effect on the trial calendar and and things like that and um it, it'll do better for victims too like if, you know they'll know who is actually working on their cases. I think, again, for the last few years, a lot of the time people don't know who's working on their case. Maybe they didn't even get a letter from the county attorney's office, so they don't know the office is working on the case. And uh, I, that's something that I would want to change right away is that communication with crime victims. They should be, they should always know who they need to talk to to get information about their case, whether that's a victim witness coordinator or the attorney on their case. Um, and then there's there's a lot of like very granular things that I would love to change right away when we get in there. So like the way we use 
the case management software could be improved a lot. You know, we could do a lot with that database that we're not doing when it comes to analyzing data and seeing how long cases are taking, seeing who our offenders are and who the who the victims are, and and kind of trying to to elicit more information from that data. Um, there's a lot we could be doing that just people haven't put the time into learning how that works or learning how to uh, analyze the data that we have. And then, you know, sort of the main thing that I would love to change in the county attorney's office is just having a trial calendar that we can all look at and say, okay, we know weeks and months in advance what cases are likely to go to trial. Obviously, things can change at the last minute. Um, you know, defendants can choose they're just going to plea or whatever it is, but we can have a lot more control over that than we've been exerting over the last few years. And um, that would have a, a hugely beneficial effect for everybody involved in the trial process. You know, crime victims right now, they don't know if their case is going to go to trial even sometimes a week beforehand. So they might get a subpoena of just a few days before they have to go to trial. Same with law enforcement officers and other witnesses. And then it's all very rushed. It's not it's not the polished um, and you know smooth procedure that it should be in an office where people are used to going to trial. So getting that calendar established in a, in a much stronger way, you know, just having regular meetings with the attorneys, we've, we probably had less than 10 meetings as attorneys in the last four years. And most of those were done in the first year, you know, it, like in the last few years, we've hardly ever met um, with the county attorney and all of the assistant county attorneys. And that should be really a weekly thing just to check in and say, where are we, you know, what happened this week, what's happening next week? And where are we on these cases that are a little bit further down the road? Um, just so we can get that trial calendar really established and, and give everybody a sense of security about when their case is going to go to trial. Just kind of a follow up on that, I guess. Um, you know, uh, we're not, I'm not super familiar with, with how various county attorneys' offices operate. I mean, some of these changes you're implementing are these based off your prior experience have you seen these being kind of played out that way elsewhere or, or what's kind of the impetus behind some of this yeah some of that is just from talking with people in other counties you know some some counties like Polk county they have a ton of attorneys and they're they're doing a lot of this stuff in a much grander scale and we we don't have that sort of option or problem here um we we we've got a decent size office, you know, it makes us sort of the, the biggest law firm in Dubuque, but um, it's not, it's not an unmanageable, uh, we're not in an unmanageable market for crime like some of these places are. Um, so I think when it comes to things like case distribution, that's an easy one because yes, other county attorney's offices, it's very easy to say who's who's going to take the DUI cases or who's going to take the sex abuse cases. You know, we have those prosecutors who are assigned to those cases. Um, things like having an intake attorney might be a little different from some other counties, especially smaller ones. You don't, you don't have the attorneys to say this one is really going to be on the front end of cases, but that's something that I've thought about a lot and talked about with other practitioners and, and just looking at the, the people that we have in our office, there are, there are attorneys who do a great job of investigating cases and, and dealing with plea negotiations who might not be as comfortable in a courtroom or in a trial setting. Uh, and I don't, there is room for that. You know, we, we, we have room for that in the office. That is a fair amount of our work happens before cases get in front of a jury. So um, I think using those strengths in a better way and not just putting people in trial because they feel uncomfortable there and they need more practice. Yes, we do that. And we should have second chairs in trial and we should have um, good mentorship and training and all that. But we can also use the people who are a little less familiar with trial in ways that play more to their strengths. You mentioned plea agreements as something that you hear from constituents knocking doors, uh, concern about that. Um, so talk a little bit about uh, how how you sort of change that culture or whether you change that culture. And I guess I'm also curious, is does an individual uh, assistant in the county attorney's office make that decision herself or himself, or is that something that has to be run by the county attorney? I mean, how it, it, you know, how do you think it should work? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the way it should work is the the attorneys in the office ought to be professionals who are capable of handling the cases to which they're assigned. And that includes making good plea agreements um, with people. Obviously, the county attorney has the ultimate responsibility for anything the assistants do. Uh, and 
the county attorney could make policies that say none of these kind of pleas or if it's uh, you know this level of felony i want to see the plea first or whatever the policy is that's certainly within the county attorney's uh, ability but ideally the assistant county attorneys should be able to handle their cases in a way that falls in line with sort of the office philosophy on what the police should be um the way that i look at it is we have a constitutional system of criminal justice that is very focused on jury trials um that's you know there's nothing in the constitution about plea agreements and, and all that stuff obviously they're going to remain a huge tool for a prosecutor's office because volume is so high um, but cases should be on that jury trial track if there's not a plea agreement relatively quickly that adequately restores a victim, adequately holds a defendant accountable, and protects the community. And it, it doesn't take us all that long to figure out what that is. You know, the prosecutor who has looked at a case, has talked to the witnesses, and is familiar with the evidence in a case knows, A, how strong it is, uh, and B, um, how serious it is and what kind of remedy is required. And we know the criminal history of the defendant and things like that. So it shouldn't take months to get to a plea agreement. That should be something that prosecutors are sending out to defense attorneys very early in the process. I would, I would like it to be sent at the same time that a trial information is sent in most cases, which is usually within 20 days of arrest. Um, when that happens, you know, uh, right now, if you, if you send out a plea agreement, uh, and somebody's, let's say in jail, somebody who's, who's held on bond, they're probably getting advice from 140 other people in jail saying, hey, don't take that plea agreement. You're going to get a better offer. Just hold off, wait till trial, see what happens. Um, to me, the only way you defeat that sort of culture is, you know, call their bluff. Yes, for a while, no doubt, we will have to go to trial on more cases because the way it should work is we send out that plea offer. We have some discussion with defense attorneys if there are small things that need to be changed or if there's something about the evidence that we don't understand. But barring that, we should have an answer on that plea bargain within the first six weeks of a case being being um, being charged. And once we have an answer on a plea bargain, it doesn't take somebody all that long to get sentenced and, uh, and out of the queue. Uh, and I think sticking to that kind of timeline, trying to get cases done within the first two months, uh, that would help a lot, not only with the quality of plea agreements that we have, but just giving people more trust in the system. It's, you know, giving victims some trust that their case is being taken seriously and, um, you know, witnesses aren't being held on the hook for years and asked to remember things that happened years ago. And uh, there's just a lot of benefits down the line if, if we can actually stick to a system of, we're going to get the plea offer out early because we want these resolved early. And if there isn't a resolution, if the defendant is not willing to take that plea offer and we can't agree, then that's not a problem. You know, that's why we have the system we have. That's why we should be able to go to trial. And and we should have prosecutors in that office who are comfortable doing that and uh, getting cases in front of a jury in a reasonable amount of time. Rich, you, you talked about timeline a little bit and trying to, what I would describe is uh, provide, you know, your uh, best and final offer, if you will, earlier on. Right. Um, which uh, might get tested uh, for a while until people found out that that was the style. But you also talked about policy. Could you maybe, and, and the ability to maybe describe a policy that others could uh, abide by and perhaps, again, follow without necessarily having to get sign off from the county attorney, just knowing that that was the policy. Do you, could you just maybe describe what your policy might be with regard to pleas in terms of uh, what you would likely do in certain scenarios? Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit hard to say like, well, in these cases, here's what the plea is going to be. You know, we have OWIs, which have a standard plea offer, and they should be taken up very quickly, taken care of very quickly. Um, we sort of have that for drug possession cases, too. And I don't think there's a, a whole lot of reason to change what's already been done for the last, you know, however many years on those kinds of cases. But when it comes to other cases, like a domestic abuse case or uh, the more serious drug trafficking cases or anything like that. I'm not able to say, okay, here's the policy. Here's how many years in prison we're going to recommend or how many days in jail. What I do think is um, having a lot of cases that get resolved with straight to probation deals is not a good policy. Um, I, I would like to get away from that because even spending a few days in jail can be 
a significant, you know, a significant punishment for someone taking their liberty for even just a few days. So I think we get a lot more bang for our buck if we actually use the jail in that fashion instead of as a way for just holding on to people who are doing more serious crimes pre-trial. Um, I, I think having more sentences that involve some amount of jail time would be appropriate. Again, it's not going to be a hard and fast policy. I'm, 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 we're always going to have discretion among prosecutors to to do justice in individual cases. Um, but I think a lot of the times, um, and and people are right to sort of question that. Like, I, I I see all these cases is what I hear from people out out on the street, and it's just you know they assault somebody the case sits for a few months or even years and then there's a plea deal and it just goes straight to probation and i think that's that's a good concern to have because at that point what is the punishment you know probation can be a good punishment sometimes um it, it can be a significant hardship but i don't think it has the immediate effect of hey you're actually checking into jail you're spending at least a few days there and uh giving a good incentive not to engage in that kind of behavior going forward um, and also just being transparent about it with the community, I think, makes a little more sense, too. Um, th there's no reason we can't say in public filings or in uh, in response to questions from the TH, for instance, about why a certain plea deal was made. Um, and uh, I think it would make sense when there are all these questions about plea deals to be a little more transparent about what the reasons are that we're entering those deals. You know, sometimes there are two cases that look very similar, uh, you know, and, and defendants get different punishments, but it turns out one of them, you had a victim who was not willing to testify or you had uh, some other evidentiary issue that was going to make it less of a, less of a sure thing. And it makes sense to, to cut your losses and move on. Um, but, that should that that shouldn't be a secret, you know. Uh, I don't think we need to to play a shell game and say that there's you know good reasons for this that we're not going to tell you about. So I don't know if that answers your question about policies, but yeah, and you you actually touched on the part that I was going to follow up on, and that is how to communicate that those pleas do do get made, how to be more transparent. I think you mentioned public filings and potentially you know, talking to you know the TH and so on. Yeah. Thanks. Given your background uh, in dealing with domestic violence cases, how how do you think uh, that system, that piece of the system works? Uh, are there improvements that you could see there procedurally or through the office to to have, um, you know, I mean, it's become a, a huge segment of the of the cases that come through the office. Can you speak to that in your experience? Yeah. Um, you know, it, domestics are considered a hard case because obviously you have victims a lot of the time in those cases who don't want to participate for a number of reasons, um, you know, emotional ties with the defendant, financial reasons, um, just sort of a, a sense of guilt about putting the father or mother of their children in, in, in jeopardy. And I think it's important for people to know that we are going to take those cases seriously. The fact is, domestics, are often a prelude to something more serious. You know, if we look at uh, a lot of the cases that have advanced to even even murders in Dubuque, it, it starts with people in a in a toxic domestic relationship, and early intervention in that is really important. Uh, it's something we have to take seriously. We can't we can't do this thing where if if somebody's not going if if somebody is not willing to prosecute, we're automatically going to say, all right, then you know what can we do? Sometimes. You know, obviously, we're bound by the rules of evidence and and what we can get in a trial. Sometimes it is impossible to prosecute a domestic without without cooperation from a victim. But oftentimes, if there's an injury, if there are excited utterances that we can use uh, from body cam footage, if there's uh, some other witness to it, oftentimes we do have enough to go forward. And I think in those cases, it's important to hold somebody accountable and to to use the tools that we have to make sure that we are taking every step that we can to protect victims and hold people accountable for domestic violence it's it's never okay to resort to physical violence in a relationship and i you know sometimes it's it's hard especially in cases where there isn't an injury um and and people will often fall back on you know it's a marriage or it's a long-term relationship and we're not going to interfere with what happens there um, but even those cases i think it's important to at least bring them to a jury if we need to and and make sure the public 
sees what's going on out there, make sure the people involved in it know what the procedure is, that we are going to take it seriously, and that they should refrain from that conduct in the future. You know, we we do have a lot of tools to help people with relationships, um, but fundamentally, the county attorney's office is just there to react and, and once things get physical, intervene. So I think we do have a duty to do everything we can to protect the victims in those cases, sometimes even when they say they don't want it. Okay. We're, we're getting close to the end of our time. Dustin, was there anything else on, on your list you wanted to hit on today? Well, I think, you know, the question that, that we've asked every candidate uh, is, is really as you're, as you're, you know, seeking support from residents and stuff, I mean, what do you point to as differentiators between you and the two other names on the ballot? Yeah, I, the easy one we've already touched on, which is neither, neither Mr. Wooden or Mr. Nelson have ever been prosecutors before. And um, I, I, I mentioned it before, it's not something that's one day you're a defense attorney and then the next day you flip the switch and say, okay, today I'm a prosecutor and, you know, here we go. That There is a learning curve. There is a change in just attitude and temperament. You have to really work on that uh, on a daily basis. I, I really think there's never a time if you're a prosecutor where you just get to coast and, and sort of fall back on your laurels and think, you know, today I'm just going to, I'm just going to process some cases and just try and clear my desk instead of trying to do justice and seek the truth. So, I do think that's a fundamental philo philosophical difference between me and anyone who hasn't been a prosecutor before. Um, and I think that's important too, like I said, for training the younger prosecutors or, or less experienced prosecutors in that office. Uh, I, I've also had the advantage, which, um, you, you know, both of my, both of the other names on the ballot have been part members of law firms. Uh, both of them have been in solo practice. I know recently, and, and Scott's been a solo practitioner for quite a while now, that's a lot different than working in an office. And I, you know, you can, you can say that uh, I was part of some office drama here, but I, I had six years in the JAG Corps of exemplary service there, uh, leading, leading people in difficult circumstances. You know, I, I hate to brag about, about a bronze star, but I, I, I was awarded a bronze star for my work in Afghanistan and it's relevant to my work here. It, it's working with different agencies, with different people, to achieve good results in criminal cases uh, in sometimes difficult circumstances. Uh, that's what we were doing in Afghanistan. And um, that's that's something that we are doing here. And it's not as difficult of circumstances, frankly, but uh, we can achieve very good results too. Obviously the other differentiating factor is the fact that I don't have a political party and we haven't really talked about that, but um, that is important to me too, because we are electing county officials who are doing a job and it's not, you know, unless it's a supervisor, you're not really legislating at all. You're not passing laws or resolutions and you're not appointing people to, um, you know, Supreme Court or something like that. There's no reason for the county attorney or really most of the other county offices to be partisan, except to allow the parties to have a chance to say, yes, we're putting our people into these positions and then, you know, getting the other party supporters fired up about trying to get their people into that position. What we should be doing is electing people who are professionals, who are going to do the job that they're elected to do. And to me, that's very important for the county attorney. It's, nobody should come into a courtroom and feel like, oh, it's, you know, that Democrat or that Republican county attorney is going to treat me differently because, you know, I'm on this side of the political spectrum or the other. Um, equal justice before the law is a constitutional right. It's a, it's a, one of the highest ideals of our justice system. And I think honoring that means uh, being serious about being nonpartisan in that office. I, I also think that frankly helps with cooperation among different county offices. I, I think uh, being able to advise the supervisors and the other county officials as a nonpartisan county attorney uh, gives it a little more weight that I'm, I'm, I'm just doing the job of the county attorney. I'm trying to give you the best legal advice that I can. I'm not trying to secure an advantage for one side or the other. I'm not beholden to a political party and trying to do some sort of work for that party. So um, it's not just my personal philosophy. I think it is actually important for the county attorney's office to be very obviously nonpartisan. If, if the election were to not go your way and one of your opponents were elected, would is there a scenario in which you'd consider going back to work at the county attorney's office? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 
like I said before, being a prosecutor is definitely my calling and I'd like to keep being a prosecutor in Dubuque. So yeah, there's definitely a scenario where that would happen. Uh, well, Rich, we appreciate your time today and uh, it's interesting talking with you. Thank you for your military service. Appreciate your service in the, in the county government as well. Um, and uh, wish you luck the rest of the way. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you.